Hello all, it's week seven, our last week of class. What I hope that this class has demonstrated for you is that first, social and cultural entrepreneurship is fuzzy around the edges. And by that I mean there's not one fixed set definition of what social entrepreneurship or cultural entrepreneurship is. I think that complexity is a strength though. Second, what I hope this class has demonstrated is there's a lot of people doing a lot of good in the world right now and that you can contribute to this good happening in the world, either by launching a social or cultural entrepreneurial initiative or supporting an existing organization or working as an intrapreneur, making social good and change or cultural good and change from within a company that you work with. So the focus of our last week of class is on the future of social and cultural entrepreneurship. Are we going to see these positive trends continue? Are we going to continue to see for-profit organizations committed to the social good and more social good organizations drawing from business practices to do their work? What tactics and approaches are going to help us make positive change in the world in the coming years? And specifically, as we work collectively about addressing um, wicked problems, the big problems, the big problems that no one person, no one business, no one idea can actually solve. You guys have likely noticed that I haven't offered a definition of social entrepreneurship. In fact, our first class project was to explore different definitions. For week seven, I want to talk just a bit about the edited collection called Social Entrepreneurship, uh, written by Joanna Mayer, Jeffrey Robertson, and Kai Hockertz. University of Michigan just actually had one of the editors, Professor Jeffrey Robinson, on campus last October. He was invited in to host a symposium on Innovate Blue's Urban Entrepreneurship Initiative. In the book, the editors pull from across the chapters to present each chapter author's different ideas about what social entrepreneurship is. This is a book specifically about social entrepreneurship, and the editors and the authors don't even agree as to what it is. The editors open the book by talking about aspects of social entrepreneurship. That social entrepreneurship is undertaken by enterprising individuals devoted to making a difference. That social entrepreneurship happens in a range of ways, including when for-profit approaches are used to support the nonprofit sector for social purposes. Social entrepreneurship includes new types of philanthropy, supporting venture capital-like investments, and it also includes nonprofit organizations reinventing themselves by drawing upon business concepts. To draw from just three chapters in the book, First, Francesco Perini, a professor of management and sustainability innovation at Boscioni University in Milan, Italy, and Claudio Euro, a student of his, suggests that social entrepreneurs are change promoters, that they strive to exploit social innovation with an entrepreneurial mindset and a strong need for achievement in order to create new social value in the market and in our communities at large. Christian Silos, a researcher with the Malik Management Center and a lecturer in business strategy and social entrepreneurship at several European universities, wrote with Kate Ganley, a research assistant at the IESE Business School in Barcelona, Spain. They describe the social entrepreneur as someone who identifies and applies practical solutions to social problems, innovates by finding a new product, service, or approach, focuses on social value creation, resists being trapped by the constraints of ideology or discipline, and has a vision, but also a well-thought-out roadmap for how to attain their goals. So even though there isn't an agreed-upon scent definition here, we can see the trends that give shape to social entrepreneurship. Identifying social needs, drawing on best practices from business, and engaging in innovation. This particular book, Social Entrepreneurship, 
doesn't address cultural entrepreneurship, but we can draw from published research and the readings we've done for class. And I would suggest that cultural entrepreneurship is an act or a process of drawing on for-profit practices to leverage arts and cultural resources for social change, specifically for the larger goal of shifting or shaping cultural beliefs, values, and ways of being. So we could be dismayed that there's not one set definition, but instead I hope you'll find encouragement and possibilities and understand that we're shaping social and cultural entrepreneurship. We're doing so right now with our work and our ideas. And that's what week seven is all about. Before we move into our week seven work, I want to talk about here Nebraska. Last year, MSU invited back Andrew and Angie Norman. Andrew is an MSU alum, and together the two of them founded and run Here Nebraska. The Nebraska we see is full of life. It's full of energy. It's full of creativity. It's full of passion. It's full of hardworking people who want to close their eyes sometimes and connect with something greater than themselves. Sometimes that comes in a church. Sometimes it's in a field. And sometimes it's amid a sweaty crowd, biting their lips, raising their fists to a musician. Who traveled from across the country. Across the world. Or across the street. To perform original art at a Nebraska venue. But what really gets us excited is the creative energy in the state. It's the ability to surround oneself with brewers and chefs. Developers, designers, songwriters and poets. Farmers and carpenters. Who are all driven to create something original, something uniquely them. We produce events that bring together people across disciplines, races, ages, and sexes to experience something new and always something surprising. And we have our finger on the pulse of the young people who are deciding whether they should make a life somewhere else or stay and make that life here. We don't know what you see when you picture Nebraska, but we know what we see. And here in Nebraska, we work our asses off to make sure the rest of the world sees it too. Join us. Here Nebraska is what I would consider to be a hybrid organization. Here Nebraska is a nonprofit, but it's one that leverages entrepreneurial ideas and entrepreneurial work to make cultural change. So I'd argue it's a hybrid organization, a nonprofit engaged in cultural entrepreneurship. The vision of Here Nebraska is to make the state a globally recognized cultural destination. They engage this mission by highlighting Nebraska artists, venues, and arts organizations. They run a Hear Nebraska radio site. They produce and promote music events across the state. For many of their music events, they bring in a famous Nebraska artist who performs with a local Nebraska artist. They engage in both cultural and economic development. Two of their other key activities are first to help build a more positive, inclusive, creative cultural community, and second, to document and preserve Nebraska cultural history, providing access to a wider audience. I think here in Nebraska is an excellent example, again, of a hybrid organization, a nonprofit engaged in cultural entrepreneurship. In our week one overview video, I talked briefly about the status of entrepreneurship at MSU and talked about the fact that our provost, Jun Yuat, wants more and more undergraduate students to have some entrepreneurial experience during their time at MSU. And I really hope that an emphasis in this experience is on social and cultural entrepreneurship. Our first reading for this week is an update report that the provost produced. Now, the report's audience is primarily donors. Um, MSU needs big support, big funders, big donors, big participants to really enhance our entrepreneurial education initiative. So that's the primary audience for the report. But I like the report because it does a good job of showcasing where MSU is at in this particular moment in terms of entrepreneurial education. 
Next, we're going to read the conclusions of two important books on social entrepreneurship. One is by Beverly Schwartz, and it's the conclusion of her book, Rippling, How Social Entrepreneurs Spread Innovation Throughout the World. And she talks about this idea of rippling or making change that continues to ripple and to spread. Then we'll read the conclusion to Georgia Levinson Kehane's book, Social Entrepreneurship for the 21st Century. And she hones in on the roles that different participants are going to have to have to sustain social entrepreneurship. The next reading by Matt Polsky identifies 12 areas where social entrepreneurship needs to improve. Then we'll read Matt Simon's piece about intrapreneurship or people who innovate from within a company or organization. And we have one case for week seven, and that's an example of intrapreneurship inside Best Buy. Finally, we have one last spark for week seven and one last spark for class. Creativity, innovation, and social and cultural entrepreneurship are braided together. So our last spark is a list of 29 ways to be and stay creative. And you're going to experience this list of 29 as a video, an infographic, and more. Your final class project, Project 6, is an individual one, and I would like for you to think of it as a capstone project. By that, I mean I want you to draw across our readings, cases, sparks, and other projects for class. For Project 6, I want you to identify a need or issue in your community and suggest a social or cultural entrepreneurial response to that need. It's up to you to define what community means to you. Your community might be the city you live in, or the neighborhood you live in, or the street you live on, or an organization that you're part of. But you have to kind of create some brackets around community. Identify a need in that community. And then describe and suggest a social or cultural entrepreneurial approach to addressing that particular need. The product is a two to three page essay. In your essay, I want you to first describe the issue, second, address how a social or cultural entrepreneurial approach is necessary to address the issue, and then third, offer some recommendations or next steps. Mention some best practices or ideas drawn from the class readings or discussions. How might we tackle this problem or this issue? Uh, what will it take to do so? Who might be involved? Project six should allow you to both reflect, that is look back across the work that we've done over the last six weeks, and it should also allow you to think forward to apply what we've been reading and talking about over the last six weeks to address a particular issue. You can find the complete assignment for Project 6 in our Week 7 folder on D2L. This week, our class officially ends on Thursday, June 30th. So your Project 6 work is due by noon this Thursday. Happy creating. Happy Week 7.